Welcome, Professor Krakauer. Thank you very much, Dr. Farrell. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm in Vietnam now, uh, working for a year uh, here in Vietnam at the University of Medicine Pharmacy in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, great pleasure to join you. Um, I uh, want to uh, make a few apologies in advance. I'm an internist and a palliative medicine specialist. I'm not a specialist in disaster medicine. Um, and and uh, uh, so the WHO, the World Health Association document that I had the privilege of editing, uh, for that I relied heavily on colleagues such as Dr. Farrell, um, both at uh, WHO and at various organizations, including World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine, the International Committee of the Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, uh, et cetera. Um, delighted to take questions at the end. I'll just apologize in advance if uh, there's something I can't uh, answer about uh, which would require experience in disaster response. I may defer that to Dr. Farrell. I also want to uh, point out that um, there are some disturbing photos in this presentation, as you can already see. Um, and I do that uh, in part uh, uh, with apologies because I don't want to disturb anyone. On the other hand, I think it is very disturbing what happens to people and the lack of, uh, uh, in the past, of uh, relief of suffering. And uh, I'll say a lot more about that as we go along. I have no disclosures, uh, no conflicts of interest. Uh, objectives for the next 30 minutes to discuss the moral and medical imperative of integrating palliative care into responses to humanitarian emergencies and crises, to explain the false dichotomy of saving lives and relieving suffering, or to put that another way, the false dichotomy of life-saving and palliative care, to describe an essential, and to describe an essential package of palliative care that uh, uh, we developed uh, working at WHO with colleagues from uh, disaster medicine. So first, just very briefly, what is palliative care? There's a lot of confusion about this. Uh, and I will just cite our document from the World Health Organization. So uh, according to the World Health Organization or WHO, Palliative care is the prevention and relief of suffering. And that's the core concept. It's prevention and relief of suffering. Now, WHO, the, the WHO definition from uh, 16 years ago goes on to say, it's prevention and relief of suffering of adult and pediatric patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness. Now, this definition uh, is in the process of review. And uh, the next part of this slide uh, gives an idea of why. So again, quoting from our WHO document, the specific type, scale, and severity of suffering may vary by location, by economic situation, by culture, and in the setting of humanitarian emergency or crisis, by the type of emergency or crisis. Suffering typically associated with chronic life-threatening illness also may occur acutely or in association with non-life-threatening conditions. And in settings such as low and middle income countries or in the setting of, of a humanitarian crisis anywhere, uh, in those settings where prevention and relief of acute or non-life-threatening suffering is inadequate or unavailable, clinicians trained in palliative care should intervene, either by training colleagues in symptom control or by providing direct symptom relief or both. So this is a bit of a shift in the definition of palliative care, mainly by saying it needs to be more fluid. It needs to respond to whatever suffering is going on. Now turning to the UN, the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination Field Manual. This gives, itself gives the moral argument for palliative care or PC in humanitarian medicine. Quote, 
International humanitarian assistance is typically an emergency response to provide assistance to a crisis-affected crisis population. It aims to save lives and alleviate suffering. And I'll emphasize those two objectives, save lives and alleviate suffering. In the uh, principles of humanitarian action from the Red Cross, there are four basic principles, humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. And humanity, that principle is described by the following, human, human suffering must be addressed wherever it is found. So even in existing uh, guidance on uh, humanitarian uh, affairs, there's an emphasis on relieving suffering. Along those lines, the World Health Assembly, which is the governing body of the World Health Organization, issued a resolution on palliative care in 2014, which stated that it is an ethical duty of healthcare professionals to alleviate pain and suffering of any kind, irrespective of whether the disease or condition can be cured, and that palliative care is an ethical responsibility of health systems. And then um, addressing the, uh, the lack of access to opioids and other controlled medicines for relief of suffering uh, and pain, the resolution states availability of internationally controlled medicines for relief of pain and suffering remains insufficient in many countries. And I would add in many uh, disaster situations and humanitarian situations. And efforts to prevent the diversion of narcotic drugs should not result in inappropriate regulatory barriers to medical access to such medicine. In other words, opioids and other medicines such as ketamine, uh, benzodiazepines, they are essential uh, and must be accessible whenever uh, there's a need. What about the medical argument for palliative care in humanitarian medicine? Well, this brings up then this false dichotomy of, of saving lives and palliative care. There is a lot of evidence that addressing suffering, relieving pain and other symptoms can itself help to save lives and uh, as well as reduce suffering. For example, uh, in the Ebola crisis where people were vomiting, uh, people had vomiting and copious diarrhea with resultant volume depletion, electrolyte derangements and uh, uh, resultant also uh, transmission of virus, controlling the vomiting or the diarrhea could help to reduce, reduce the volume depletion, the electrolyte derangements, and further virus transmission. It's been well documented, uh, for example, in the, um, the uh, citation on this slide, that control of postoperative pain can reduce uh, many kinds of risks, postoperative risks, such as for pneumonia, if people are not uh, inflating their lungs because it hurts to do so, Deep vein thrombosis if they're immobile because of pain postoperatively, cardiac events such as uh, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, arrhythmias because of uncontrolled pain. And there's other examples of this. And finally, a study from the US military showed that use of morphine during early trauma care uh, after serious injury can reduce risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. So treating suffering, treating pain uh, is not only, uh, there's not only a moral argument, there's also a medical justification for this. So I'd like to uh, turn uh, uh, the presentation over for uh, a few minutes to my colleague, Dr. Uh, B.R. Dobman, from also from Harvard and Mass General. Thank you, Eric. So we've talked a bit about the ethical and moral imperative of integrating palliative care, um, but looking at the current status, um, in summary, basically palliative care is not integrated, that this doesn't exist. So most of the medical humanitarian guidelines that we use have little or no information on palliative care. So the SPHERE handbook, which is a really a wonderful introduction of considerations of quality and accountability to humanitarian response, 
unfortunately, in its most recent 2011 edition, has no mention of palliative care. Um, there's an asterisk that our hope is that um, in the most recent edition that will be coming out hopefully in 2018 that that may change, but as of right now, um, palliative care is not integrated. When we look at the triaging categories that these expectant patients, the patients who are not expected to survive, um, often are neglected or abandoned, that they, they are in the current system triaged to the lowest rung, even below patients who require you know, little or minor health condition attention. It's difficult to look at as many of the most easily quantifiable results um, are privileged. So often we're looking at mortality rate as a rate of success when we're engaging in these humanitarian responses. Um, and we would argue in palliative care that a lot of this data looks at saving lives or not saving lives and doesn't really quantify anything on relieving suffering of our patients. It's also certainly important to note that many mental health services are not available in these low and middle income countries to treat the, both the acute and the long-term psychological consequences of exposure to these traumatic events. I would say it's clear that the scope of the suffering is, is enormous that the, the most recent data we have from the United Nations Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates 128 million people throughout the world to be requiring humanitarian aids. Um, I think it's important to mention that these types of emergencies and crises are quite variable, that certainly there's many climactic and geologic events, earthquakes, storms, tsunamis, that humanitarian aid is required. Um, I shudder to think that about what it would look like to have massive radiation exposure. Certainly, we're looking at generalized public health emergencies, epidemics, armed conflict, war, political, ethnic violence. Um, so palliative care, as Eric mentioned, is all about responding to the need. So you can imagine much different types of palliative care suffering throughout those different types of events. So this table looking at common symptoms and distress caused by these complex humanitarian emergencies highlights a little bit um, the variable needs and how palliative care may look different in different crises. Certainly a lot of the data that we have on Ebola shows a, an enormous amount of physical suffering that both acute and chronic pain, with the pink being acute and or chronic, or the orange being acute suffering, um, and gray being more chronic. Ebola kind of checks all the boxes here that there's going to be an enormous amount of both physical suffering, everything from pain to delirium to dizziness um, to emotional to psychological distress of PTSD, of acute and chronic anxiety and depression. And then the data we have looking at certainly pain is going to be a major factor um, and a major focus of palliative care responses throughout any of these epidemics, um, but that the data may change and the needs and the response of what palliative care looks like may be variable throughout these different types of suffering. I'll pause here and, and say that those disturbing slides that Eric mentioned are coming up in the next few slides. So if that's um, something you don't want to see, I will also let you know when those next few slides are over and you can tune back in. So here's just an example from the Haiti earthquake in 2010. Certainly the main medical needs were trauma surgery, critical care, but I would also argue excellent palliative care as well, that these patients experiencing devastating crush injuries, pain, psychological distress, you know, all at once experiencing the loss of a limb, the loss of a home, the loss of family and community, um, certainly palliative care would be a priority there. Here we see a child again from the Haitian earthquake um, who presented critically ill, having lost her foot, who knows how much the rest of the leg will remain. Um, and then having, if you can see the notes here that were, were jotted down, um, it's unknown if her father is okay. She was, she was brought in alone um, and there's no data on if any of her family have survived. So she's, certainly she's experiencing severe physical suffering, but also this, this trauma of um, loss and abandonment and psychological pain as well. Moving on from the, the Haitian earthquake, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014, certainly there was an, a need for excellent critical care of infectious disease specialists um, and a major need of palliative care as well. As we look through in that last graph, um, Ebola hit all of the areas of different types of physical, emotional suffering, acute and traumatic. Um, in this case, probably less of a surgical need of acute care than in the Haitian earthquake, but more likely more critical care, more palliative care. And I would also highlight here in these pictures that the suffering um, in this case was often made worse by the stigma associated with patients who experienced Ebola. The last picture will show again our, our most vulnerable patients, those with advanced chronic illnesses who are struggling with their health care in the best of times, 
um, throughout a humanitarian crisis are going to experience um, increased needs, and so they're they're going to be the most vulnerable here. And in this case, you could argue that the main medical care need would be palliative care. So the top picture here would be um, a patient who was found on the street um, dying of AIDS-related illness, who was an orphan and who um, was undomiciled. That was in Vietnam. And these last three patients are patients who are um, had advanced cancer, as you can see, both in Haiti and Uganda. And this just highlights that when health, the healthcare system collapses because the whole social structure collapses, um, these most weak, vulnerable patients are gonna lose access to the chronic care that they need for dialysis, for chronic care, for pain management, for cancer care. Um, so it highlights that palliative care may be a major need in these cases. Uh, I think that is the end of the most disturbing images, so feel free to tune back in. Thank you, uh, BR. Um, so uh, this, uh, I hope, gives a, an idea of why there's growing consensus that palliative care must be a part of responses to humanitarian crises. So in the last part of this presentation, I'd like to present an, a, a package of palliative care uh, that is based on the work of the Lancet Commission on Global Access to Palliative Care that I also had the privilege of serving on um, and uh, adapted for the purpose of humanitarian crises. Just to give you a little background on the Lancet Commission, um, we first, uh, working with experts in health, health economics and um, health policy, estimated the global burden of health-related suffering by identifying the serious conditions in the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD-10, that most commonly result in physical, psychological, social, or spiritual suffering. We also estimated the types, prevalence, and duration of suffering from each condition. And based on these estimates, and this was a huge amount of work, as you can imagine, but I well, I won't, don't want to focus on that in this webinar. Based on these estimates, we designed an essential package of palliative care to alleviate the most, uh, most health-related suffering um, and designed to be accessible by anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances. So it's very basic, but part of the beauty of palliative care is that it doesn't need to be expensive or high-tech. Uh, most, almost all of what's essential is uh, very inexpensive and, and readily available. The package consists of a set of interventions, a set of medicines, a small set of equipment, a small set of social supports, and the human resources. And I'll go through each one of those to finish this presentation. That we identified from the ICD 10, and you have the most uh, commonly thought of. Uh, 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 conditions that generate a need for palliative care, such as cancer. But I just want to point out uh, two major categories, or one major category here, which is injury, poisoning, and external causes, extremely important for disaster medicine, and hemorrhagic fevers. Not, uh, 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 not a huge number of patients, we hope it never will be, but the, the degree of suffering uh, very, very uh, high uh, with those patients. The interventions are these, uh, prevention and relief of pain and other physical suffering, whether acute or chronic, prevention and relief of psychological suffering, again, acute or chronic, social suffering, whether acute or chronic, and spiritual suffering. The medicines are based, uh, the medicines that are in the essential package are based on the WHO model list of essential medicines, but adapted for this purpose. And these medicines, uh, the criteria used were that they're necessary to prevent or relieve the specific symptoms or types of suffering. They're, uh, they're safe to prescribe. Um, and administration requires a level of professional competency that's easily achievable in generalist doctors, uh, assistant doctors, uh, nurse anesthetists who have basic training in palliative care. And, and these medicines offer the best balance in their class of accessibility on the market, clinical effectiveness, safety, ease of use, and low cost. Uh, the WHO model list 
relies on evidence. And so there are some medicines on the model list for which there's a lot of evidence, but they're rarely accessible or available on the market. And there's other medicines in the same class that are very accessible. So um, those are just the constraints of WHO, and that's why we uh, altered the list uh, slightly. This is the essential list of medicines, and I won't spend a lot of time, but I will point out that both oral immediate release and injectable morphine are absolutely essential. And then two uh, medicines that are commonly considered uh, psychotropic medicines, uh, in some places, uh, doctors won't prescribe them, generalist doctors. They, they're thought to be prescribable only by psychiatrists. And this is a part of the reason that uh, mental health services are so rarely accessible, because many places there are very few uh, psychiatrists. Fluoxetine or, or another selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, very, very important for mood disorders such as depression and anxiety disorders. And haloperidol, an antipsychotic, uh, very important for a variety of indications, including uh, 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 common types of nausea and vomiting caused by an emetogenic toxin, as well as uh, agitated uh, delirium. Uh, and it's also a good anxiolytic, but it tends not to cause delirium. Equipment, again, uh, we assume that disaster teams have a lot of uh, basic equipment uh, uh, used for wounds and dressings. Um, uh, but an opioid, I will point out, opioid lockbox is important uh, in some settings more than others, but uh, uh, controlled medicines such as opioids, um, ketamine, uh, uh, ketamine actually not controlled in many places, but benzodiazepines and opioids certainly should be uh, stored safely so to minimize diversion. Social supports. Uh, so this is already a part of uh, disaster response uh, by uh, some organizations. Uh, in our essential package, we included this set of social supports at least for uh, patients and for their principal caregiver living in extreme poverty uh, with the idea that these are needed to assure that the most, most basic needs are met, food, housing, transport, and to promote dignity. Uh, it's recognized that ministries of health may not uh, provide these social supports. Uh, they need to be intersectoral or provided by a different ministry, but they, the, but they are still part of an essential package and they are essential, at least for people living in extreme poverty. And finally, the human resources, doctors, nurses, uh, social workers, psychologists, pharmacists, community health workers, this, uh, the staffing will depend on the level of the healthcare system. Is it a referral hospital, a provincial hospital, a, a district hospital, a temporary hospital, a health center? And also uh, competencies may vary. So for example, in Uganda, specially trained nurses are able to prescribe opioids. Um, nurse anesthetists may be able to do that. Um, but uh, I'll just point out again that psychologists or counselors uh, uh, are extremely important, especially where there's psychological trauma. The essential package of palliative care uh, is uh, very, that I just described is very basic, and it, it uh, really would uh, be beneficial to modify it more for humanitarian emergencies and crises, and this can be tailored to the type of emergency and crisis. But these are uh, some of the modifications that are recommended. So injectable fentanyl for uh, preventing pain from brief procedures, also as analgesia for patients with renal failure, which was very common, for example, in Haiti, where there was crush injury and rhabdomyolysis. Injectable ketamine, again, for a variety of purposes, uh, such as preventing pain from brief procedures and dressing changes, as well as anesthesia. Midazolam for conscious sedation and again for short uh, procedures uh, and uh, fentanyl transdermal patches 
for patients with uh, moderate or severe pain who may be near the end of life and cannot take oral meds, oral medicines, or who have renal failure, slow acting uh, oral morphine for those who can take oral medicines, and then pediatric formulations. Uh, equipment uh, uh, can be added, uh, such as wheelchairs, walkers, and canes for, for people with injuries, and then human resources. So what we're recommending is that all physician members of emergency medical teams, possibly except surgeons, if they're going to be in the operating room all the time, should have at least a basic training course in palliative care uh, which means about uh, a minimum of 35 hours or one week uh, full-time, two weeks uh, half-time training course in palliative care. And we're developing such a course uh, as we speak, uh, as well as basic training uh, in palliative care for nurses. Not, these are not palliative care specialists. We're not saying there needs to be a palliative care specialist with every team because most palliative care is not that difficult and with basic training, do, any doctor or nurse can provide most of what's needed uh, if, uh, with that training and with the essential package. Uh, some specific situations in humanitarian emergencies and, and crises. Uh, more, it's, uh, we think that more attention should be paid to expectant patients wherever possible. There should be a quiet and private location for them, not just pushed aside. Symptom relief is sometimes not that easy. Sometimes it requires intensive care, uh, similar to ICU care, to get pain or, or, or vomiting or seizures or whatever it is under control. Psychosocial support for family members and then bereavement support, especially important with sudden uh, traumatic death. Extremely traumatic uh, humanitarian emergencies and crises such as war and genocide may result in severe long-term psychiatric sequelae and there mental health specialists uh, with basic training in disaster medicine are, are needed. Uh, where uh, the crises affect children uh, specialists, what we call in the US child life specialists, those who are who, who uh, are skilled and trained in working with traumatized children can be very beneficial. And then uh, for protracted humanitarian emergencies and crises with many physically disabled patients, physical medicine and rehabilitation specialists and physical therapists trained in disaster medicine are very important. This just gives a very basic outline of uh, the, what the basic palliative care training would be for members of emergency medical teams who respond to HECs, that's humanitarian emergencies and crises, the basic principles of palliative care and ethics, emphasis on this overcoming the false dichotomy of saving lives and relieving suffering, Communication, how to uh, break bad news uh, in a culturally sensitive way. Assessment and relief of all different types of suffering, physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. Optimum use of life-sustaining treatment in crisis situations. And very importantly, clinician resilience and self-care. This is very difficult work uh, with high risk of burnout. Finishing now with uh, something that uh, Dr. Dobman mentioned, the triage categories. So traditionally, these, this was a, a standard type of triage uh, uh, categorization. Red for immediate uh, care, immediate intensive care, whether it's surgery or resuscitation, survival possible with immediate treatment. Next was uh, yellow. Uh, the uh, care can be uh, delayed because there's not an immediate danger of death, but treatment needed soon. Uh, and then green will need medical care at some point after patients with more uh, critical conditions have been treated. And then down at the bottom was expectant patients, meaning survival not possible given the care, uh, given the care that is available. So there was almost a devaluing of uh, the importance of caring for dying patients. Uh, 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 
Well, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, this is the new recommended triage categories with also a change in color, which was uh, the result of uh, meetings about this organized by WHO and others. So there's uh, uh, number one is immediate uh, care. It's still uh, red. Uh, survival possible with immediate treatment. Palliative care should be integrated with life-sustaining treatment as much as possible. Clearly, we do things all the time uh, that cause pain, that cause suffering in order to achieve, at least to, uh, to possibly achieve a greater good like saving life. That's what surgery is. But palliative care should be integrated into uh, care of patients triaged red or immediate as much as possible. Second is uh, uh, we call 2A, expectant patients. That is now blue, it is not black. Survival not possible given the, given the care that is available, but palliative care is essential. Expectant patients may not be ignored or abandoned. 2B is delayed. Uh, they're still yellow, not an immediate danger of death, but treatment needed soon, and palliative care under symptom control may be needed immediately. And similarly with green, uh, they need medical care at some point, but symptom relief may be needed uh, immediately. So this is the new recommended triage category. So I'll stop there uh, and welcome uh, any question or comment. Thank you, Dr. Krakauer and Dr. Dobman. Um, we are now at the point of the webinar where we can take questions from the remote audience. And um, if you uh, would like to ask a question directly, you can use the hand, like raise hand icon um, that would appear in your uh, control panel. And we can unmute your microphone and you can ask a question directly to the presenters. Or if you prefer, you can also send a question through the um, chat feature as well. So um, we will open it up for questions now. Professor Kirkhauer, it's, it's uh, Dr. Paul Farrell. <clears throat> I have um, a question which may be a little difficult to answer at this present time, but I think it's something that needs to be brought to attention. And that is that uh, as someone with significant experience in teaching uh, disaster triage, <clears throat> one of the uh, components that I think is really important to, to bear in mind from the palliative care perspective, that uh, the few studies that have been done show that uh, acute triage decision-making is significantly erroneous in 58% of cases. So if a patient is handed to you by an acute team as being expected either 2A or, um, or black under the old system, I would ask you to comment on whether you think that's the decision you take and accept from somebody else's uh, assessment, or do you believe that the palliative care team or members of the EMTs with palliative care experience should then do their own reassessments to, to in fact determine whether that assessment which was done sometime in the distant past is in fact still accurate? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Farrell. Uh, I think it's a good question, and I'm, I feel a little bit um, uh, unprepared to answer it, being uh, not being a specialist in disaster medicine. But I would say uh, the latter. Uh, I think that uh, it behooves us uh, always to reevaluate uh, clinical conditions change, and uh, I think that. Uh, by paying more attention to expectant patients and by just assuming that expectant patients triaged expectant or 2A will receive uh, care uh, that yes, uh, whoever is providing palliative care, whether it's a nurse anesthetist or an EMT, emergency medical technician, uh, may, uh, may uh, uh, feel that this patient can be saved and yes, that sh that reassessment should be ongoing, just as it is in the hospital. Even in you know in in Boston, in a teaching hospital, there are times when we're asked to see a patient 
uh, for end of life care, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking that there's uh, somebody missed something, and that this situation can be corrected. So I think yes, absolutely, we should always reassess, and if there's a a, 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 a something is noticed and and someone's opinion is different of of what this patient's prognosis is, that should be uh, brought to the attention of of others. Thank you. All right, we do have one question from the audience here uh, from Dr. Ann Catherine Goodman. Um, I see that she has her hand raised here, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, Dr. Goodman, and you can go ahead and ask your question. You there, Dr. Goodman? Oh, she may have stepped aside. All right, we will. Here we go. Oh, okay. We go. Oh, yes. Yeah, so sorry, I was I was technically challenged by the mute button. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that great overview. And I I was curious, uh, Dr. Krakauer, um, what. Uh, you thought would be a good way to do training for disaster professionals. Um, I, I'm very interested in, in, in that aspect. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Goodman, uh, AK, who's a colleague of mine from Mass General and who is an expert in disaster medicine and from whom I'm constantly learning. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I would hope that this could be integrated into standard training for humanitarian responders, that it would be just part of the training that that um, that team members must undergo. Uh, and we're, I think that in the very near future, we'll be looking for opportunities to do just that. For example, the Military Medical Academy here in Vietnam um, and it's, uh, it's Burns Hospital uh, is the, is the um, headquarters of the National Disaster Response Team, and they're very interested in this idea. And maybe at Mass General, uh, this, could, this would be of interest. And uh, this is something that Dr. Dobman and I, and perhaps you also, Dr. Goodman, would, uh, something that we could work on together with any interested colleagues. Uh, so if there are people listening, who are interested in integrating palliative care training into the training that uh, for your team or your teams, um, please, uh, let's see, how should we do this? Um, maybe send an email to either Dr. Dobman or me, uh, and I think you can find our emails uh, at the, either at Harvard Medical School or Mass Massachusetts General Hospital websites. Um, and uh, and maybe we could collaborate. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the question, Dr. Goodman. Uh, and, and if it's easier, um, I can just put your contact details in um, an email that I'll send out as a follow-up to the presentation. Um, so just uh, so everyone knows, we didn't mention this um, at the beginning of the webinar, but we did record the presentation uh, and we'll post that online. Uh, either later today, but definitely by tomorrow morning, and um, we'll include in the email that informs everyone of that um, contact details so people can reach out to Dr. Dobman and Dr. Krakauer. Uh, I do have a few other uh, people here in the remote audience with questions. Um, I have Patricia. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, Patricia. Are you there, Patricia? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, this is um, Patricia Schwertley. I'm on the MSF Australia board and um, also at Monash University in Melbourne. Thank you very much for the presentation. I've got a lot of questions, um, so I'll try to triage them. Um, but we did have a palliative care motion that was passed at the International General Assembly for MSF that was written by two nurses. Um, and some of the, the barriers that we face in MSF is humanitarians that question how feasible it is to introduce palliative care into settings, humanitarian settings, where even in peacetime um, and without the crisis, the healthcare systems and the ministries of health don't actually offer palliative care. So, and where perhaps the 
the cultural interpretations of providing analgesia until somebody dies is perhaps less understood and could potentially be a security risk. So I'm just wondering on your for your thoughts on that. And secondly, but this could be in a um, in a in a email follow up. Um, just wondering about the research gaps in palliative care in humanitarian settings. Um, what sort of questions and methodologies would be useful for humanitarians to conduct in the field? I don't think we're very good at measuring suffering. Um, and therefore not very good at evaluating the effectiveness of palliative care. So I was just wondering to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Those are really, really good points. Um, so on the first the first point, you're absolutely right. Uh, I basically am devoting most of my career to uh, try to make palliative care more accessible in low and middle income countries, whereas you very rightly say, it's often not accessible at all. Uh, so, um, I guess I would say that there certainly there are cultural issues, uh, the way pain is understood uh, uh, in different cultures and different settings uh, varies, but, uh, you know, I see uh, the integration of palliative care into uh, a humanitarian response as a way to promote palliative care in low and middle income settings, because, partly because uh, uh, an important job in humanitarian response is is helping to enable and strengthen the local healthcare system and local providers to provide more of the uh, the response to uh, humanitarian emergencies to help strengthen and improve the local healthcare system and part of that could be introducing concepts of palliative care and uh, it's uh, as being essential as uh, agreed upon by all 194 member states of the World Health Organization when the resolution was passed in 2014. So yes, it's true, it often doesn't exist where the disaster is, but the response can, can help as it were to infect the local, uh, the local healthcare system palliative care. Uh, the research question, uh, it's a really important and good point. There is a section in the WHO document that was just published this week online, um, and I have the, um, the website in uh, one of the slides at the beginning, uh, so this WHO document. You can also just go to WHO Palliative Care uh, Humanitarian Emergencies, and uh, if you Google that, you should be able to find it. Research is obviously very difficult in uh, uh, humanitarian situations. There's such a focus on patient care, it's hard even to justify research, even though it's very important. Um, and you're also absolutely right that indicators of palliative care accessibility or in quality are the existing ones are not good. And this is something that we in the palliative care community struggle with a lot. There's a lot of work going on trying to figure out how to better measure something so subjective as symptoms like pain and nausea and dyspnea. These are very subjective. Um, uh, quality of life, there's various quality of life measures. So uh, yes, absolutely, um, there, uh, there does need to be more research to guide palliative care in humanitarian situations and uh, you know, I think uh, there needs to be a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, discussion on exactly what the indicators need to be, what measures need to be used. For now, you know, measuring uh, pain, uh, uh, with the presence or lack thereof, or maybe just in very broad strokes like none, mild, moderate, severe, and then access to basic necessities, and then maybe some uh, psychological assessment. There are very simple assessments for depressed mood and anxiety that, that might be useful. Okay, did, did, it looks like Patricia muted her microphone, so I think that was the end of her questions. Or did you have any more? No, I just want to say thank you, great answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then I have a question that's come in over the uh, chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and read that. This is from Mary Jo Kintner. 
And Mary Jo says, is the opioid cr crisis causing difficulty in obtaining drugs for use in palliative care? And then she has a second part to the question, uh, has there been thought of including hallucinogens in treatment of suffering in palliative care? Hmm. Uh, well, the second answer first, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, it, there's not really a consensus about use of hallucinogens in palliative care, um, uh, and it's not, it's not standard. Uh, so, uh, it, and I, I don't know of any evidence for it. Um, that's, that's a relatively easy one. Um, the opioid crisis, yes, uh, there's, there was a lot of, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of mythology related to opioids, and the opioid, uh, the epidemic of opioid overdoses in a few countries, namely U.S. and Canada, is making things worse. So, for example, when uh, a year or so ago, the CDC, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, came out with uh, recommendations about opioids, uh, they were actually very well done and accepted palliative care, cancer pain, um, uh, palliative care and cancer pain uh, and post-operative pain from the uh, strict regulation. Uh, but just the fact that the CDC, U.S. Centers for Disease Control came out with some recommendations for trying to limit uh, improper use of opioids, that news went around the world. And so, for example, colleagues in India uh, suddenly were confronted with uh, uh, some, some comments from leaders in India that we have, to, we have to limit access to opioids. So, you know, I think that, uh, I think that uh, we, we need to, that the medical and nursing community, the healthcare community in general needs to, uh, take much more seriously the WHO concept of balance in opioid policy. So that we need to be more careful and more judicious about uh, minimizing improper use of opioids and much more active in maximizing access to opioids for legitimate indications. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, the opioid crisis is, is, is scaring people and making people more worried. And even in, in the U.S., it's become harder sometimes to prescribe uh, in unusual situations where very high doses are needed, as happens sometimes, or unusual combinations. Uh, so it, it's a problem. Um, it's partly caused by the healthcare community itself with uh, improper prescribing. There's a lot of other contributors. The marketing by drug companies uh, is a big problem, and I would even say immoral in many cases. In, uh, uh, the, uh, the ability of pharmaceutical companies uh, to influence legislators by uh, their campaign contributions so that we don't have very good laws. Um, um, so there's a variety of, of issues there. Uh, so yes, the answer in short is yes, it is a problem. Thanks, Dr. Krakauer. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Um, so barring any last minute um, questions from the audience, I think um, we can go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we did keep it under 60 minutes as, uh, as scheduled. So um, did you have any last kind of parting comments you wanted to make prior to the conclusion of the webinar, Dr. Krakauer? Uh, a couple. Uh, one is that the WHO document, I would encourage everyone to look at it. It's available online and to realize that this is a, a very new, uh, a, a new effort to integrate palliative care into uh, responses to humanitarian situations. Uh, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, has been a leader in this. And in fact, um, one, of, uh, one of the leaders of MSF Switzerland has written about this uh, and was one of the stimuli for, for this WHO document. Uh, in the beginning of the document, there is an email address of a colleague at WHO to whom feedback can be sent. And although this is now published, we welcome feedback because we're inventing this. We're figuring out how to do this. 
and all those who are listening who have experience in the field, we welcome your comments and your suggestions. Uh, so that's one. And secondly, I just want to thank again, uh, Dr. Paul Farrell and, Doc, and, and Andrew uh, Lavelle for inviting us to do this. And we're looking forward to uh, a World Association Disaster and Emergency Medicine meeting in Brisbane, Australia next May, where we will continue this discussion. Thank you very much.